Welcome back, everybody, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you love these videos, go ahead and support at patreon.com slash tawahedo. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. You could also subscribe to the newsletter at oxum.substack.com. Today, my special guest is Stephen Sashin of Zero Shoes. And I have to say in advance, this is not an ad. It may look like an ad, <laughs> but I am the type of person who genuinely believes in sharing information with people when I think that it has made kind of a, a big life change for me. And we'll get into that. But first, good morning, Stephen. How are you? Good morning. I'm very well. Uh, w when you say special guest, it worries me what you mean by special. So <laughs> <laughs> Different, unique, set apart, uh, something yeah, odd. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Good recovery. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the way I found out about the company of which he's CEO, Zero Books, is because I'm a fan of another podcast by Dr. Peter Atia called The Drive. And he had Dr. Irene Davis on from a Spalding Center where they do a lot of physical therapy. Oh, no, wait, uh, hold on. You got to say Harvard's Spalding Center. Harvard's because, Spalding yeah. Center. Yes. We got to add the the prestige of the Ivy Leagues there. Exactly. Uh, a, very, a very top institute. And one of the fascinating things that I found is that um, Dr. Irene mostly talked about in that episode dealing with people who had sort of injuries and it was a, a kind of this whole idea of what we're going to get into about barefoot shoes or minimalist shoes was seen as kind of an after the fact remedy. Whereas Dr. Peter Atia and my own personal interest was more about being proactive. Right. Um, and I, and I wonder, um, maybe that's a kind of a good place to start as, as any. Well, let me, let me, I'm going to start in a slightly different spot from you and, and, and do Go ahead. this. First of all, I like to say to people, when they ask me what I do for a living, I say, well, let me ask you a question. Do your feet feel better at the end of the day than they did at the beginning of the day? And people always <laughs> say, no. I go, well, why? And they're like, what do you mean? I said, well, that's not normal. That's not the way it's supposed to be. I said, the reason that that's happening is the shoes you're wearing aren't letting your feet do what's natural. Because if you let your feet do their job, which is bend and flex and move and feel the world, the rest of your body can do its job naturally. And, you know, at the end of the day, you could still feel fine. If you aren't letting your feet do their job, then the function they try to do, again, about balance and agility and mobility and sensation, tries unsuccessfully to move into your ankle, your knee, your hip, your back, um, and causes all sorts of problems. And so... What we're doing um, with Zero Shoes, and again, I'm not trying to do this as an ad, is yeah. to get out of the way to let your feet do what's natural, let their feet do their jobs, so the rest of your body can do its job. And what Irene Davis, um, who's a dear friend and wonderful and wonderfully smart human being, uh, she's the leading researcher in minimalist footwear and the benefits that it provides. And she does this amazing presentation in the Peter Atia podcast, I thought was a perfect version of it, of here's how the research she's done. She shows that modern footwear, especially modern athletic footwear, actually causes the problems that they claim to cure. And the solution is to get out of that and into something like what we do. Now, the when people say that, you know, they, they ask for the proof, of course. And what's really fun is during that podcast, she detailed all of the research that backs up both sides of that story. And what people forget is that prior to 1970, f most footwear looked actually a lot more like ours. And we're not the intervention. You know, the, yeah. when people say, where's the proof for what you do? I go, no, 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 no. Where's the proof for the intervention, which is the modern athletic shoe? And I can tell you the answer. There is none. There's tons of evidence about why they cause problems and not about why they provide solutions. And in fact, I'll stop ranting after this little bit. Um, you know, my favorite version is Nike has a new shoe out that they say is designed to reduce injury, which is kind of a funny comment to begin with because there's no shoes designed to increase injury, but injury rates have been pretty constant for the last 50 years. 50% 50 of runners, 80% of marathoners get injured every year. That hasn't really changed despite all the magic, new, wonderful technology that the big quote, big shoe companies keep putting out. And this new Nike shoe, the React Infinity Run, did in fact, in a study designed by Nike and paid for by Nike, but run from an independent lab, did in fact produce 50% fewer injuries in, a, in the 12 week study than the other shoe, the control shoe, which was another Nike shoe, the best selling motion controlled padded elevated heel running shoe that they make. But what people didn't realize because they didn't look at the data uh, is that 
the old running shoe injured over 30% of the people in 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. The new shoe injured only 14 and a half percent. Now, this is like saying, which restaurant do you want me to buy you dinner from? The one that gives you food poisoning once every seven meals or once every three meals? Neither of these are good answers. So the fact that, that in a short study, one out of seven people got injured, this is good news? <laughs> and that's how yeah. it's presented, you know, huge amount of press about how wonderful this is. Has there ever been an equivalent study with minimalist shoes or Perfect even barefoot? Question. Perfect question. The answer, the short answer is no. And the reason is that doing studies like that are time consuming and expensive. And the companies that are doing things like us, we mm -hmm. are not big companies with huge research budgets. Um, and the big companies don't want to fund it because they know the truth. Actually, it's even funnier. I was on the, uh, a panel discussion at the American College of Sports Medicine and two of the other panelists, one was from Brooks and one was from Adidas, otherwise known as Adidas if you're American. <laughs> and um, I just did that to be cool, but that is how you pronounce it. So anyway, yeah. the guy from Adi, he says, and that's what you say if you're super cool, you call it Adi. So the guy from Adi, it's really just what you do when you're in the business. Um, he says, you know, look, we're trying to improve performance and reduce injury, but we don't have evidence that we've done that because creating that kind of study would be very time consuming, very expensive and have a lot of confounding factors. Mm -hmm. And what I was thinking, because it wasn't appropriate for me to say it in real time, is, dude, if you could make a shoe demonstrably better than the guy from Brooks who's sitting next to you, it's worth billions of dollars a year. And you're telling me the only reason you haven't done it is because it's hard. It's nonsense. You have more than enough cash. You had plenty of time in the last 50 years. And those confounding factors are very easy to, to, to factor out. So they haven't done it because they know that they haven't been able to because they do internal research. Um, Nike, in fact, did some research on a shoe that they were developing a while ago, and it demonstrably injured people during the, the wear testing process. And so they didn't release it. You're never going to see the results of that study but they've done other similar things. So, yeah. so, so in, in some, no, there isn't a longitudinal long-term study about barefoot versus uh, shod running and having people transition uh, to, to do that effectively. And more importantly, seeing what happens after they've made the transition, which takes a different amount of time for each person. And we can talk about that if you like. But, um, but conversely, there are no studies on the other side proving that any, sorry, wait, I'm going to do one last weird thing. Irene mentioned this too, I think. Here's my favorite study about uh, traditional athletic footwear. There's this idea that you need one of three different kinds of shoes, like a stability shoe or a motion control shoe or a neutral shoe or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the army put that to the test and they, they tested, I don't know, I think it was maybe 1500 people or something approximating that. And they, they broke them up in half and they put one half of that group in the shoe that was appropriate based on the evaluation. Mobile, uh, motion control, stability, et cetera. And the other half, they just put in random shoes. And the injury rate between the two groups was identical. So wow. this, this thing of like what shoe companies have come up with to say, here's how to put you in the right shoe, zero evidence at all. And if you want to have fun, go to a running shoe store where they do evaluations of your gait and recommend a shoe based on that. And then just go to five different stores and see what happens. <laughs> Get five different results. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've personally had, I don't remember what they were called, but like sort of like shoes that had extra bounce in them. But I've also had um well, uh, I gotta wait a stop stop right there. Were, but, There's no yeah. such thing as extra bounce. There's yeah. just things that suck less. You don't get, you know, a trampoline bounces you because of what you do with your legs, not because of the magic of a trampoline. You can't get more energy out of something than you put into it. So all cushioning sucks literally and figuratively yeah. um, there's the question of how it sucks and even more all cushioning is essentially tuned to a particular weight and a particular speed how much you weigh your mass and how fast you run which in, impacts ground contact time and if you're not that right weight and traveling at that same right speed then these things don't work as well and all foam all cushioning breaks down over time. So whatever it was like the first time you ran in it is going to be very different the second time you run it, let alone the you know 20th or 30th time, which is why most shoes say they have a five, a three to 500 mile 
uh, um, repurchase rate, they want you to replace them within three to 500 miles. And if you look at the research on that, the, those shoes actually started becoming crap at about 150 miles. So, wow. um, so people don't understand the physics of this stuff. So they're susceptible to bullshit marketing. Like watch how high this ball bounces off of our new magic foam. Congratulations. You're not a ball. You are a human being, <laughs> very different physics. Uh, and, and yours are generally 5,000 miles? Is that we have right? a 5,000 mile sole warranty because we don't have that foam midsole that breaks down. Mm -hmm. And we also made the rubber in our outsoles uh, just more, more abrasion resistant. So what happened with, run, with shoes from quote big shoe is they, made, they over time figured out how the foam was going to break down and made sure that the rubber breaks down at about the same time. So you have to replace them. Got you. Yeah, okay. I I have been experimenting with your uh, HFS for about mm. a month now. Love that. Shoe. And uh, I got a some a Z Trail on the way, which is the sa the sandal shoe. And um, on Twitter, Doctor Irene told me go very slowly. So <laughs> I, I I've gone very very slowly, not to try to induce you know any injury. Yeah. To your point about being gradual, but for example, this past week I just ran. 800 meters just Perfect. to see what I felt like. And <clears throat> I, I feel fine. Can you talk a little bit about this idea of going on your forefoot versus going on your heel? Because you yeah. could purchase one of these minimalist shoes or barefoot shoes, but if you start walking the same old way, I imagine that would not be a good idea. Right. So there's, there's a bunch of, myth, there's a ton of mythology about this stuff. And I'm going to try and demythologize a lot of it. So, and, and one of the stories that pops into my mind when I think about this is people hear that when you're running barefoot or in a minimalist shoe, you're supposed to land on your forefoot. And I, um, and it's not quite true, but it's kind of true. And I'll explain why in a second. But what really woke me up about this was <clears throat> one day I made a pair of sandals for a local runner and I said, let's just go for a little run so we can see what it's like. And she's reaching out like as if she's wearing her regular shoes and her foot's about to land way in front of her body. And then she mm. points her toes. So she's kind of prancing as she yeah. ran. And I, I literally stopped her after two strides. First of all, I was stunned. I never thought that anybody would do that and couldn't figure out why they would. But the second thing I said is, whoa, 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 that's going to, you're going to get a stress fracture if you do that. Your, your foot is not designed to handle those kind of forces. So it's not about landing on your forefoot or midfoot. Well, Irene will, will, will argue this and I'll make her point as well. But it's not about landing on your forefoot or midfoot or heel as much as getting your foot to land more underneath your center of mass instead of out in front of your body. Now, when you have a, a shoe with an elevated heel, it's really, really hard to land with your foot underneath your center of mass because you have this heel that's getting in the way. The way your mm -hmm. foot would naturally contact the ground, you'd bump into your heel with that way in front of your body if you're wearing an elevated heel shoe. If you're running barefoot, your heel would kind of come near the ground as it finally then lands, as your foot finally lands underneath your center of mass. And it most likely would land on your midfoot or your forefoot. Now, Irene's research shows that landing on your forefoot, which isn't on your toes, um, it's kind of ball of your foot. And it doesn't mean you That's stay how I grew up calling it was the balls of the foot. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't mean that you don't let your heel drop naturally to the ground because you want to use your Achilles tendon as the amazing spring that it's built to be. But that's the initial contact point would be, say, the ball of your foot. She found that she thought midfoot, which is basically landing kind of flat footed or mm -hmm. landing on your forefoot, ball of your foot would be basically identical. But what she found is that it's actually better to be landing on the ball of your foot on your midfoot, or sorry, on your forefoot. Because what you do when you, when you do that is you're actually having your muscles in your foot, your muscles, ligaments, and tendons in your foot, align the bones in your foot and ankle to be in the strongest position. Basically to use the arch and you, there's, you have th three arches in your foot but to use the primary one, what's called the longitudinal arch, that arch underneath your big, your first toe, your big toe, which is what most people think of as their arch. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's using that as an arch, which is the most stable structure that we've ever invented. And we didn't, and we got the idea from humans or from bones and from animals and from other things. But when you align everything that way, you're creating something really strong and useful rather than having your arch flatten out and then be unstable. And because when you, when you engage your arch, it also engages your ankle. So when people say, Hey, I pronate, well, first of all, there are zero studies showing a correlation between pronation and any injury whatsoever completely made up by big shoe companies to sell shoes. Um, but when you engage your arch and engage your ankle and land on your forefoot, it's basically practically impossible to pronate. 
And, but again, not an issue, even if you do, but it just doesn't really happen. So, but the, my point about demythologizing it is it's not about landing on your forefoot. It's about getting mm -hmm. your foot underneath your center of mass. It's about not putting on the brakes every time your foot hits the ground because it's in front of you and then having to reaccelerate by pulling your foot across the ground. It's using your butt and your hamstrings to propel you forward by extending, which means going behind you a little bit rather than pulling towards you, which is putting both of those muscles in weak positions. So um, when you're, if you try running barefoot on a smooth, hard surface, which is what I recommend for a very short period of time, the short version is doing it wrong hurts, doing it right feels mm. good. And if you pay attention to that by not doing too much too soon, by doing these little doses like what you described to start letting your body get that feedback, that's the other important part, so that it l figures out how to move differently. Um, that's the goal. And it'll take a different amount of time for different people. Some people pick it up really quickly, some people takes longer, but the feedback is also critically important. And the more you have between you and the ground, the less feedback you get. There's a reason that we have more nerve endings in the soles of our feet than anywhere but our fingertips and our lips. It's to tell our brains what's going on with the other end of our body so it knows how to control everything in between. If you don't give your brain that information, it, it makes you literally dumb. Um, and, and so either being barefoot or in a minimalist shoe that still gives you good ground feedback, that's gonna let you make those gait changes more naturally. Uh, and Irene would argue that you need to do a bunch of strengthening first Walking is great. There's research showing that just walking in a shoe like ours builds up intrinsic foot muscle strength. Um, I would argue that you get the same benefits by just doing what you did, a very short run, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, then building yeah. up you know, by 10 seconds every time once you feel comfortable with those initial times. One thing that does kind of make me different, it, it's weird. Um, my family's from Ethiopia, so we have this sort of like national ethos behind oh, yeah. barefoot. Yeah. But then I have like personal things in my life. I just thought it built my immunity. So I've been walking around barefoot in my home for years. It so probably, that, it, it, you know, it may, and I've been the same way. I went to Asia back in 89 and you're constantly taking your shoes off and to go into places. So I started wearing my shoes like really loosely tied. And then yeah. I just stopped. Uh, and then I, I liked the habit of taking them off when I walk into my home. I haven't worn shoes in my house in, you know, 30 plus years. That's amazing. And and then, you know, of course, nationally in 1960, we have uh, yeah. Shambhal Ababa Bekila or the captain Ababa Bekila, who famously won in Rome just a few decades after the fascists had invaded us. Uh, he goes and wins barefoot. Yep. Um, <laughs> well, I do a joke about that. He wins He wins the marathon uh, running barefoot. And then the next marathon, uh, the next Olympic marathon, he wore, in sh wore shoes and then he yeah. died after that. He, yeah, <laughs> now, not immediately. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> it had nothing to do with the shoes, but come on, yeah. he was barefoot, fine. Then he wore shoes, then he died. So, yeah, so. The, the very short version, yeah, <laughs> of course, it had to do with, had to do with a, a car accident. But I wonder, I wonder about it because, um, I think it was something like the people of Tokyo were giving it to him as a gift. What, uh, what happened is, um, I can't remember, uh, there's there's a couple specifics, but the gist is that I think the shoes that he wanted to wear like didn't show up or vanished or got ripped or something. And then he was offered some other shoes and he's like, I'm not gonna try a new pair of shoes. I'll just run barefoot. Yeah. And, you know, and what's true in many parts of Africa where people do grow up living barefoot and running barefoot yep. and running to and from school, shoes are a status symbol. And especially if you're a successful runner and you're getting paid to wear them, you can now wear these shoes, have that status level increase and enough money to support your family or your village. <laughs> That's, you know, so people say, well, why don't Olympic athletes wear, you know, run barefoot? I go, because they're not being paid to run barefoot. They're being paid to wear those shoes. And again, it's a big status thing in certain places as well. So um, the, the, the financial motivation is significant. And, yeah, that, and that prestige element is is huge. big too. I remember growing up, again, there's so many things that prepared me to when I just heard the podcast, I just kind of immediately went to you all because I knew that this was the kind of right move. I just yeah. hadn't been acting on it. My grandfather had purchased shoes for his more rural uh, family who was barefoot, you know, most of the time. And for the sake of him, whenever they would come visit in the city, they would put the shoes on. But as soon as he's not looking, they would take those off. You know, oh my God, and I so it. I I know this generally, yeah. um, but you know I don't know necessarily what that means. <laughs> but but you but you just nailed something that I really like is when we when I talk or when Irene talks about how bodies are supposed to work and what and and what shoes do and don't do. The most common response to most of these points is, "Oh, that makes sense." 
And it does. What doesn't make sense is the stuff that we've been sold for 50 years with really literally brilliant marketing. Like again, when Adidas came out with their boost foam and bounced a two pound steel ball off it and showed how bouncy it was compared to bouncing that ball off, you know, quote the other company's foam, which is a foam that no other companies ever used. Uh, and it doesn't really bounce on that other foam. It's like, that's a really cool thing. But again, you're not a two pound steel ball. It doesn't really matter. So we've been, we've been told for the last 50 years that we need cushioning, we need arch support, we need motion control. And we've been told that for so long that now everyone just thinks that it's true. Uh, you know, you tell a lie long enough and people believe it. And we've been told you need pronation control and or supination control. Again, there's just no evidence for any of this. And the magic question once again is, why do we have the idea that feet are somehow poorly made and need all this extraneous stuff that you need for the rest of your life when you would never say yes to that for anything else. If, you, if you, you're in a car accident, you get a little whiplash and you go to the doctor and they put you in a neck brace. And the doc, if the doctor said to you, yeah, you're gonna have to wear that for the rest of your life. You would think he was a moron. But when you go to a shoe store and you say, you know, I've been having a little knee pain when I run, which could be caused by overstriding, landing with your footway in front of you, landing on your heel and sending a force right through your joints because there's research showing that if you want to give animals arthritis, you just hit their heel repeatedly and they get knee oh. osteoarthritis. Um, but you go into a shoe store and they go, well, you're gonna have to you know, wear this insole, this orthotic in your shoe to support your arch for the rest of your life. And you go, oh, that makes sense. Why does it make sense? If you put your arm in a cast, you know it gets weaker over time by not letting a joint move. If you don't let the joints in your foot move, they get weaker over time. There's research. I mean, I call it the stupidest research in the world. We have to prove that immobilizing your foot makes it weaker and using your foot makes it stronger. Why in God's name do you have to prove that? It's so self-evident, but we have to prove it because the shoe companies have been telling us for 50 years the opposite. That there's something wrong with your feet that you can't use them properly. They need support. You're, you know, everything's going to hurt. And despite the fact that people over and over keep trying new variations of this and don't get positive results, whenever a shoe company says, hey, we have a new kind of cushioning, everyone goes, oh, that's going to be the solution. They never say, hey, here's our new cushioning. And by the way, apologies for that crap we've been selling prior to this. Uh, they, they never say that at all. So it's no. sort of like the boy who cried wolf. Every 12 to 18 months, some shoe company has some new quote magic technology and people rush to it. Um, but in the boy who cried wolf, that story, the villagers eventually got smart in our real life story. The villagers keep getting snowed by marketing. Yeah. The, the issue I think is it's, it's so easy to try to make people's lives easier, um, on the short end, but then hide the pain on the long end. What you're saying is there's various transitionary periods for people on the front end, which might be slightly less comfortable, but in the long term are making you stronger. If you if you take your arm out of that cast, you have two choices. Get a sling and never use it again, or do a little bit of strengthening work and get it back into shape and then you'll be fine for the rest of your life. So which would you rather do? Um, part of what you're talking about also is just a capitalistic thing of uh, people, marketers convincing people that there's an external solution, an instant external solution to any problem they have, when that's not always the case. In fact, it's very infrequently the case. Um, so yes, what I'm saying is, if you take the short amount of time to learn how to use your body naturally, to build if, um, intrinsic foot and ankle strength, that could support you for the rest of your life. And it's never too late to start. We've had elderly, I'm not gonna make any medical claims. I'm not a doctor, mm -hmm. I don't play one on TV, the internet or podcasts, but we've had elderly uh, customers who've emailed us and said, uh, I've been wearing your shoes for a couple of weeks and I just threw away my walker. Wow. And, and, we, and we've had blind people who said, this is like having a whole new sense. I'm actually walking mm -hmm. more confidently because I can feel things. We've had the number, it, it just if you go to our website and look at the 25,000 plus five-star reviews and look at the number of times people use the phrase changed my life or, you know, I'm on my feet all day because I work in a hospital or a restaurant or a school or a factory. And it's the first time I'm able to do that pain free. Again, it's not because we're doing something special. We're getting out of the way. So your body can do what bodies are built to do. And when people say, Oh, but we didn't evolve. Oh my God, you're the perfect person for this. They'll say, we didn't evolve to, you know, run on hard concrete surfaces. Uh, you grew up in Ethiopia. Uh, what's hard packed mud like? <laughs> Not fun.
Yeah, as hard as concrete. So you know, we evolved um, to we evolved to be able to handle multiple different kinds of surfaces. And even if we didn't evolve on a hard surface, that doesn't mean we're not equipped to handle a hard surface. But we did evolve to handle hard surfaces and rocky surfaces and things with prickly sticky things on them and things that are super hot or super cold. So footwear fundamentally is just something to protect your foot and something to hold that on your foot. That's all you need. And then, you know, there's little variations on that that you can build into it, like extra traction or, you know, whatever else. But the fundamental yeah. is really, really simple. That's what I actually wanted to ask you about some of those variations. So mine, the shoe that I got from you, I had the insole in it. And, you know, speaking with customer support, I was trying to say, like, I want to have maximum sensitivity, maximum feeling. Yeah. The idea is as less as possible. Can, can you talk to me a little bit about who would want to have the kind of insole versus who removed it? I personally removed it because yeah. of the philosophy you just said of of making it like just quicker access to getting the that natural strength. Yeah. So my fundamental goal with our product line is to let your feet move naturally first and foremost and be as close to barefoot sort of second to that. And pardon me, I suddenly got the hiccups. Um, and so what that means is like the most barefoot friendly product we have is a sandal that we call the Genesis, which is just four millimeters of rubber and some cord to hold it around your foot. And it's not like a flip-flop because you don't have to, you don't get the pressure point of that thong between your toes because mm -hmm. the lacing system holds all the way around your foot. But that's, I mean, and that's as simple as you can make it. In fact, the earliest footwear that's ever been discovered came from uh, an archaeological dig in Oregon. And the sandal that they found is very similar to our Genesis sandal in design. Um, wow. It's got a sagebrush sole and then a lacing system similar to ours that just wraps around your foot. So Th those are like American Indian shoes or moccasins? Uh, or? Well, no one's totally sure, but probably. Yeah. yeah. So the um, uh, could have been aliens. I don't know. You know <laughs> I'm, I'm open. <laughs> not, not really. But uh, uh, so we've had some people say, look, um, that sandal's great, but I need a little extra protection. Mm -hmm. And I go, okay, so we added a little bit of foam to a sandal we call the cloud. And they go, that's great, but i running a bunch of trails, and I need a little more than that. So then we did our Z-Trail mm -hmm. sandal, which has a little bit of extra foam. But still, it's so little foam in there that it barely compresses, which is a really interesting thing because people register it as being super comfortable, despite the fact that it barely compresses. And so I have an idea that evolutionarily, we learned that that tiny amount of compression was signaling something good, like food is nearby, water is nearby, something like that. Uh, so we have a, we now have a snow boot, a fully waterproof snow boot. So that has a lugged tread with, you know, bigger lugs. Mm -hmm. And then it has a little bit of cushioning on the inside. And then it has the, the fully seal, seam sealed waterproof booty. So that's not quite barefoot, but compared to any other snow boot is giving you more feedback than you would otherwise get with a more flexible sole than you would otherwise have with, with that extra traction. Same thing like our Mesa trail shoe is essentially the same as that HFS that you mentioned, except with a sole that has a luggier tread for trails. Now you don't need these other things. You can learn to run trails barefoot, but yeah. that takes a lot more time. So in the interim, before you decide to go that aggressive, that, minimalist that natural there's things that we can do to accommodate specific situations that doesn't compromise the those fundamental principles of letting your toes spread so they can work naturally being low to the ground for balance and agility not elevating your heel which messes with your posture being flexible enough to let your foot move naturally and giving you enough ground feel to get some sensation to your brain so it knows how to help you move better that that's important to know it's not like a black and white maximalist versus minimalist, but it's a sort of spectrum between kind of, that. Kind of. It's a, it, it's a spectrum to a point. And this goes back to Irene Davis's research. So she breaks things down into what she calls minimalist and partial minimalist. And mm -hmm. I said to her on my podcast, I said, I think you're being politically correct. And if you were, <laughs> uh, if you were drunk at a bar, um, you would agree that what you mean is real minimalist and fake minimalist. And she did not disagree <laughs> with me. And so, the fake minimalist products are pretty much all the ones that were made by the big shoe companies that claim to be minimalist, but have enough cushioning that the biggest thing that happens is you don't feel enough from the ground to mm. make those gate changes to stop doing things like overstriding. Yeah. So um, that's the critical part is you want it to be thin enough and flexible enough. You can still feel things giving you that little bit of protection still, 
um, and also have a nice wide toe box so your toes can spread. There have been a bunch of, quote, barefoot shoes that have come out in the last year that have these toe boxes that squeeze your toes together. Well, there's research that shows that when you do that, you can't use your arch properly. Circulation gets cut off in your sole and you, your foot doesn't move correctly. You don't have the same kind of balance. Like when you, um, if, you're, if I asked you to drop and do push-ups, you'd put your hands on the ground with your fingers spread out because that mm -hmm. gives you the most balance yeah. and actually the most strength. <laughs> yeah, you don't put your fingers together. <laughs> same thing with your toes. If they're squeezed together, you're not getting the most, you're not using your foot as well as you could for whatever you're doing, whether it's walking, hiking, working out, lifting weights, running, you know, or you name it. So I will say that actually, uh, Dr. Peter Atia mentioned this as well. And in the, in that episode, what's, what's fascinating is that I, I looked at a few different competitors and the reason why I ultimately chose yours to start off is because of that, that width I've had personal issues, just like trying to decide between different shoes where, you know, I'm like, depending on the brand, it will be a 10 and a half or an 11 or an 11 and a half, you know right. what I mean? So right. uh, on that basis, um, without knowing that added benefit or even thinking about pushups, which I'm actually a, an avid pushup person. So huh, you and me both. great analogy that you gave me. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I, one of my COVID things, I got into a pushup challenge um, back in like April, I think. Yeah. And uh, it was super, super fun. I mean, I hadn't really like paid attention to push-ups in a while, but now I'm a total push-up dork. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not, it's one of my favorite things to do now. I'm so glad to hear that because the other thing that you did that's different is usually when I hear people deep dive on shoes, they're mm. usually long distance runners, but you're also a sprinter <laughs> and one of the fastest sprinters in your, in your uh, bracket there, your age bracket yeah. and, and sex bracket as well. Could you talk to us about that? And I've also seen some of the ads about the parkour and I've been a Ninja Warrior fan. So just oh, seeing people daring in that way, was a, uh, it was kind of funny for me. I was like, well, okay, I, I, I'm not ready for that yet, but that's definitely <laughs> exciting to look at. Well, well I mean, I'm an all-American gymnast from way back when, so it, parkour didn't exist then. That was just what, you know, we didn't, there was no nothing called parkour. There was just, we jumped over a bunch of things. Um, yeah. we, we, we bounced off things and climbed on things. If there were parkour or Ninja Warrior then, that's totally what we would have been into. Um, but yeah, I've been a sprinter. I'm not a distance runner. I It's just not my thing. And it's really funny, Harvard's Daniel Lieberman, he says that we all evolved to be persistence endurance hunters. So we just, you know, run or walk, run slowly to basically hunt down our prey. And I said to him, yeah, um, that's not true. He said, what? I said, well, I'm a sprinter. And he goes, well, you just didn't train properly. I said, that's what all you slow people say. No, it's a whole different thing. And we, and I said, what it is, you guys may have like slowly walked or, you know, jogged to, get an antelope to wear itself out. And then you killed it. My guys showed up and they carried it home because all my friends, we deadlift three times our body weight. And none of your friends can, you know, do a push up. So, um, That's amazing. Uh, so sprinting is a very different thing metabolically. It's very similar. Actually, if you look at the kinematics, how your body moves in space, it's actually, it's actually more similar to distance running, especially high performance distance running than people think. Um, but just the forces are, are much different. They're applied faster. Um, you end up with a straighter leg when you're, when you're landing as a sprinter than you do as a distance runner, but, but it's not a whole lot different. The fundamentals don't overstride, um, uh, find the right cadence. Um, it's, it, we're, we're built to run well. And ironically, what gets in the way of doing that is footwear. If you watch little kids before they've gotten into shoes, Oh my God, it's beautiful. They have perfect form. They use just enough energy. They rest when they're in the mood to rest. They have this, they do get this weird expression on their face. It's called, um, what's it called? Smiling. Because uh, <laughs> they're doing it fun. And, but the, but the thing that really is amazing is looking at the form. They have the right cadence. They have the right body lean. They have the, they're landing on the, uh, underneath their center of mass. And then they start putting on shoes and you watch it go away. I mean, it's, it's, the most incredible, saddest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, and so in relation to the the minimalist shoes and and the barefoot, do you do you sprint barefoot? Do you sprint in the minimalist shoes? Mm. Does it make a difference whether someone wants to walk long distance, run, hike, or sprint? Um, no, and yes. So fundamentally, no. Uh, I, so when I'm on the track, I'll do the first part of my drills and warm ups barefoot, which will mm -hmm. include doing 1500 meter runs barefoot, usually on the infield, mostly because if I'm running at full speed, 
Um, my maximum speed, I've, I've been on a treadmill where I hit 23 miles an hour for a couple of strides. And with the way track surfaces are made, that would just rip the crap out of my feet. Uh, mm -hmm. So when I'm on the track uh, at all, at well, if I'm on the track at anything faster than a jog, if I'm warming up, I'm fine. But anything faster than that, I'll be in one of our shoes, typically the Speed Force, which is our lightest and closest to barefoot shoe. And then for competition, the way tracks are currently designed, uh, spikes come in handy, but there mm -hmm. are better, mostly for traction and especially during the dry phase when you're getting out of the blocks and just building up your acceleration. But there are other designs for soles that are more efficient than spikes that work with natural or work with modern track surfaces that don't currently exist until we come out with ours in a while. <laughs> well, that, well, that's a good, uh, kind of, uh, preview for it. So that that's good. Did I hear you right? You, you do about a little bit under a mile, 1500 meters prior to. So no, for, I think for some people that might no, sound oh, like oh. long distance. As yeah, a warm up, no, no, what no, no, was no. that? No, I, I would never do something like that. Are you crazy? Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so actually, I got it. It goes this way. Um, uh, my first barefoot run, I, I was so enthralled with it. I was so curious and interested. Like, what happens if I run faster or run slower or run at the same speed but move my legs faster or move my legs slower? What happens if I land on my forefoot or the ball of my foot or the inside of my foot or the outside? I was just like so curious. And we were running on trails and on sidewalks and on roads and on grass. And at the end of this run, someone had a GPS watch on. And I said, how, how far was that? She goes, that was about a little over 5K. And it's like, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I mean, I had no idea because I was so fascinated. But uh, my normal training, uh, I mean, so I can do it, but I just don't like it. So mm -hmm. my normal training, uh, the warm up will be like run 100 meters down one side of the infield, walk across the infield, run 100 meters back, and then repeat that like, Mm, two to two to four times. So I'll run one to, you know, somewhere between 400 and 800 meters total. Mm -hmm. And then a bunch of uh, just mobility drills and flexibility drills and little hop, um, um, skipping drills and lunging drills and hopping drills and bounding drills. And then uh, from there, starting to just do acceleration drills and then get on the track for whatever the workout is. And the workouts for sprinters, sometimes it's actually just whatever your race is just running fifties or hundreds. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's working on maximum the maximum velocity phase by putting little um, mini hurdles, like six inch high hurdles in on the track. So you have to not only clear them, but land in between them properly or acceleration drills where you have, you lay out cones at an increasing distance between each other to make sure you're putting your foot in the right place to what someone refers to as violently attack the ground until you force yourself into an upright position, which is a, um, a great metaphor because you really can't be lazy during those first 10 steps. And so there's drills for that or what's called fly-in drills where you set it like 10 to 15 or 20 meter sections where you want to run full speed, but you just accelerate to that point. Then you run full speed and just repeat that until um, you can't do it at anything better than 95% of however fast you went. It's a weird way of putting it. But um, the key with sprinting is it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like doing high intensity powerlifting. You want to give yourself a short burst of all out effort, then a lot of rest until your efforts uh, have diminishing returns. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in that. And I, <laughs> I deadlift too. I'm a, ah. I, I subscribe to kind of the strong first ideas, uh, Pavel Sosselin, the guy who mm -hmm, introduced sure. the, the kettlebell. So he's big. He says, you know, minimum five minutes, sometimes 10 between sets. So that's awesome. Uh, strength is strength is strength is demonstrably valuable for all runners. Most runners are afraid to do any strength training for reasons that I don't fully understand. Uh, and for sprinting, it's, it's very important, but it's also important to find the thing that translates the best to sprinting and there's really nothing that translates perfectly to sprinting um, mm -hmm. but just general strength and conditioning is helpful making sure you can use your glutes and hamstrings is helpful doing do you know nordic hamstring curls do you know that exercise i'm not familiar what, what uh, is that? imagine kneeling on the ground and having someone hold your heels down and then you mm -hmm. just try to slowly fall forward and just you know go as far as you can and ideally you'd end up flat on the ground under control but the reality is most people get to about 15 degrees of uh off vertical and then they fall because their hamstrings aren't strong enough wow. so 
it's a it's a eccentric hamstring strengthening exercise and e strength eccentric hamstring strength is very important for sprinting so that's a, a really good exercise uh deadlifting is a great exercise for all running and sprinting um i made the mistake of getting really into de- two things actually i had this one sprinting coach i was get, when i was getting injured a bunch at the beginning he says how much can you deadlift and i said I, well the most i've tried was 250. he goes what do you weigh i said about 150. he's call me when you're deadlifting over 300. Because once you get over twice your body weight, strength really solves a lot of problems. And yeah. let me know what happens. And after I got over 300 pounds, uh, a lot of my injuries disappeared. But then wow. I made the mistake of to keep going. And yeah. the, first, the first time I pulled 400 pounds, that was bad because my next thought was, ah, crap, now I want to do 500. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there is a point where, you know, it's just not necessary, but yeah. it's kind of addictive. Deadlifting's fun. Yeah, I'm, I definitely haven't gotten that high up yet. I think the most I've ever done is is two seventy. Um, I usually go for more reps, and so I'll I'll work at a, a much smaller weight. But yeah, that that is exciting to to get to double your weight and then three times your weight. That's when you know you're really strong. It's it, it's pretty crazy. Um, and what what's really fun? I mean, look, I'm five five. I weigh one hundred and forty five pounds. It's really fun when I was going into gyms where they had a. Uh, they had an Olympic lifting platform. There was guys, you know, pulling like 300, 350 who are just these big guys and they'd finish whatever they were doing and they'd start to take the weights off the bar. And I go, no, that's okay. Just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. i one of my favorite deadlifter squatters was uh, Mark Henry, the, oh, uh, yeah. the wrestler. He used to go by sexual chocolate. And he, one time he's six foot three, 400 pounds, but he would deadlift like 900 and squat a thousand, or it might be the reverse. And so he entered this dunk contest one time. And so he's six, three, he's tall, but he weighs a lot. So people were skeptical and it was filled with like ex NFL athletes and NBA (laughs) athletes. And he actually got third place in the dunk contest because he was dunking. But the way he was able to do all that is because he still he's still doing more than double his weight, even though he weighs so much. There's, there's a guy that I, that I occasionally, um, well, I see at track meets, um, local sprinter who he's, I guess he's about 37 or so now. And he, he weighs about 225, 230 pounds. He's, he's, uh, he's 50 pounds heavier than he wants to be, but there's no way he's going to get down into 170, 180. Um, but he's still crazy fast because he's crazy strong. So even, and he's not that tall. He's maybe 5'10", 5'11", you know, 225, 230. I mean, he's- That's scary. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, it's it's scary when he's coming up behind you. It's terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) But it's also really fun. And watching him run, I mean, his form is just amazing. And so between applying force in the right way and being really strong, he's overcoming the fact that he weighs way more than he would like to weigh. And, um, it's not uncommon with sprinters. Sprinters tend to put on some belly fat as they get older, but, and I can tell you at 58 Mm -hmm. losing it is really gets harder and harder every year for some annoying reason. Uh, but, but again, yeah, strength is a strength is a very helpful thing and most people don't have enough of it. That's awesome. This has been great. Let's do a proper plug. Can you tell everyone the name of where they can get the shoes, the name of the website, how to spell it? Because I think that's the counterintuitive part for them. (laughs) Well, um, so yes, um, uh, zero shoes is X-E-R-O shoes.com. Happily, I own Z-E-R-O shoes.com as well. So it'll redirect you if you spell it wrong or your your computer autocorrects. Um, And then you can find us on social at either at zero shoes or slash zero shoes, wherever social media accounts exist. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, Total pleasure.